That's a rather crude practice recording of Rose Song, performed by some members of the Women's and Men's Fire Circle here in southern Jara country. We meet regularly in the forest to listen to country, listen to ourselves and each other, sing and sound out into forests beyond thought, beyond words, love calls and creaturely grunts and growls as embodying, loosening returning and releasing processes that strip away our becoming hubris and ground us back home in country as continuums of mother country. This podcast episode we're calling Mother Cake, Love and Relationship with Brigitta Kupfer and we invite you to make some space for this gentle mother elder wisdom. We know you through your son, initially, who came and volunteered here um, probably six months ago in in the warmer season, and he brought with him many gifts, including music, and uh, he also brought with him the story from home, and how you live at home, and we got to know you through him. And last night we shared uh, a mid-winter festival together at the summer, the winter solstice. And um, you and your partner Murray joined us and stayed overnight and helped clean up, <laughs> <laughs> see the forest and the ceremony site on mm. the wet, damp, cold other side of the solstice and as we now head towards the light ever so gradually um and it's your birthday (laughs) (laughs) a special day Mm. um we at breakfast over pancake breakfast um we invited you to come on to the podcast and and share some of the things that are moving in you. Um, you particularly, you sent us an email about the video we made, uh, we posted, um, which I spoke, arriving at the Church of Mother Country. Mm. And this really, um, yeah, I felt your spirit really connect with that. And so we thought we would record this in case... We both felt it was worthy to share with our listeners. And so before we get to that um, more present moment, I thought maybe you'd like to to paint a, a picture of leaving home, going off to university. Who was that young woman? Mm. Okay, I'll start with there. But I also want to say first that because it's my birthday and being here yesterday, coming to the solstice celebration and mm. and being here today and having a birthday breakfast with you, it's it's just really a, a wonderful birthday present. So, yeah, and, and you're offering to do this uh, mm. conversation. Mm. Yeah, it's lovely. Good Thank to be you. here. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, going back to the young... Teenager, maybe. Oh, maybe I have to say, yeah, growing up in Germany with as the only girl of in a family with uh, four kids, three older brothers, and a very conservative and uh, very religious on my mum's side family. Um, you know, that that was very limiting for a young girl, and that uh, I had to. 
Oh, my teacher actually had to convince my dad to let me go to high school because he thought it wasn't necessary for a girl. So I went to high school. And uh, and in some way it felt like there was a break at that time with my dad or with the family, sort of going my own way. That was not theirs. It was like, mm-hmm. so it was a bit of a, you know, that falling out, out of the nest a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so my friends became more important and family and I, be- uh, then family, and I um, became a very, I don't know, rebellious. So I was really sort of oppositional or probably mm-hmm. would have a diagnosis today. <laughs> I know which one. <laughs> Defiance, <laughs> defiance <laughs> disorder. <laughs> and I'm so glad saying that today to mm. say, my God, uh, if I hadn't, you know, I don't want to know what happened to me. So I'm so glad mm. I had this mm. strength mm. to oppose these uh, mm. restrictions yeah. and limitations. And so I became politically engaged very early and and create with others fem- women's groups and you know so so that was my time and and yeah and also a bit of the dangerous time before the last two years in school where you know you were not hanging out with the best crowd or so and mm-hmm. but i sort of made it through and looking back and i don't know how how did i do that all you know <laughs> the many things i did and i mm-hmm. went through um yeah and then I I wasn't quite sure. I thought I have to go to university, but I, I didn't go straight away. And had um, with two other girls, we um, had a an apartment. Uh, I left the, the day I I finished school, so I really couldn't wait to get you, away. You left home. Yeah, I left home yeah. as soon as I finished school, and uh, so we tried to live this really. Um, yeah, socialist model. We we actually shared everything. One, we, you know, one had a car, one had a bike, one had a little motorbike. So, mm-hmm. and and we sh- we actually rotated over across the jobs we did because mm-hmm. it was one cleaning, one um, waiting, and one it was sort of tutoring. Yeah. So we did um, share and and and, mm-hmm. and trying to sort of model. Then I did uh, go into another shared house and. Yeah, with lots of political activities in there and with that group. And was this uh, in a city? Or? That was in a smaller. I mean, sort of about sixty thousand, sort of a smaller yeah. city town. Yeah. yeah. Um, North Bavaria, northern Bavaria. Mm. Yeah. So um, I then I was in an amateur puppetry group then, and we were good and won national prizes and. Did you say puppetry? Puppetry. Oh, I was a puppeteer then, a, yeah. am- amateur puppeteer with a group. And and was that polit- political? That was not, no, yeah. that was not. That was yeah. really just a fun thing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, But then I got this offer to do that professionally with a professional theatre. And I did that for two years, travelling through Germany and Europe. And so, and afterwards I thought... Um, Oh, now, now I have to become someone. <laughs> I have to do my academic studies. Mm. So it was in early 20s, 23, 22, 23. And um, I could have, because the the director of this puppet theater, he wanted to actually sort of retire and get out. And he actually offered. He, he thought I could actually take that on. And I... Th- and I think back and think I was I could have you know it was something really worthwhile doing and I but I had then in my head that's not a profession this is this is not you know so I had this still I have to become somebody Mm. and and so I had to and so what did you become yeah well you you went off to university I'm I'm in the middle of of, or in the long long unbecoming of having become a psychologist Mm -hmm. Um, I studied psychology in Heidelberg in Germany then. Mm. But again, um, yeah, being in this world after being, I guess, sort of a free spirit mm. was really f- 
finding that very narrow walls of these patriarchal power demonstrations mm. and you know uh, being the academy it, in the academy yeah. mm. but i i did again then lots of fun things i mean i wrote poetry i worked with a artist who was who was my age who was uh, the age i'm now and i was sort of in my end 20s or something mm-hmm. early 30s then so we did a lot of projects she was uh, again sort of political activists and we did those projects together mm. um yeah there was a wonderful mentor and and uh, i did work and and um all kinds of things and stretched out my st- time at uni for an over period of nine years until really I worked as a psychologist or as a therapist already sort of as a co-therapist and as a student counselor but my final you know um, f- finishing was actually after nine years and <laughs> and then I became a clinical psychologist in the psychiatric system mm-hmm. so this is um, the lead up to that I really got into this um career and then ambition and you know sort of uh, um, starting a PhD and then you were in the system and then publish or perish and mm-hmm. I was invited to to the states because I developed some a program I never would develop ever a program anymore <laughs> so it's a, mm-hmm. a program is something uh, quite um, wrong in my sense Uh, I felt, you know, just to mention that quickly, uh, when when I heard Charles Eisen just now talking about a sanity, pro- uh, some a program for the sanity project, I said, ah, oh, please, mm. please, no program. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm I'm far away from that now. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we come to this time where I had this big turnaround in my life. I was then thirty eight. So before that, your presumably your career is starting in the nineteen eighties, somewhere around there. Yeah, and your end ninety end of nineteen eighties. Yeah, and your you've come from a very patriarchal family. Um, you had some advocacy on your behalf to to uh, elevate you into a, a, you know further education. Your teacher was backed you and. There's some love there and some support. Um, the politics of socialism and feminism that I'm hearing um, and uh, a kind of career orientation in terms of um, not so much necessarily careerist. In I'm not hearing mm-hmm. fame and ego, but certainly um, in that structural sense of career, um, in, into into a, a profession that's taken seriously and um, elevated as in in with status in the do- within the dominant culture is mm. that yeah I think mm. that my motivation I guess initially came really um, from making the world a better place you know yeah. Yeah. going for this uh, but. It was a str- it was a fear based system. What I was my work was not, I guess, um, supported in these rigid structures. Yeah. That um, because it was uh, experimental. Or? Yeah, and it was a, a different relational and psychosocial orientation, right. which yeah. in that department hasn't been there before. And can you give an example of how you were working within your profession and how how the profession feared that? Uh, rather funny example is when when a patient got better, that's at least such and such percent of the medication. Uh, you know, it was always about uh, who owns the progress of the patient. Yeah. But you know, there was one. One, for instance, who, um, who who came, you know, just sort of long-term patient from doctor to doctor, and and then 
they sent her to see me and for a few sessions and <laughs> and came with her husband and I asked her a few questions and they went away and when they came back m much later a lot has changed for them and then um, yeah, they all wanted to know what, what miracle cure I had uh, done and really the simple thing what I asked was um, if you didn't have this problem or these symptoms coming what would you do mm. so, so just you know we just sort of stretched that out what <laughs> the very simple thing and then they just remembered that they had a caravan at home and and a few more things and that sort of developed into that they actually it's just to point out that just the questions were not asked and it was was about you know it's mine i have to prove that uh mm. this medication is yeah. uh, this and and it was i mean so it it's, it's so much bigger it's so much complex yeah. to talk about sure. this um what's especially what what has sort of evolved since then yeah. um with, with in in the general population mm. the acceptance of these labels mm. i think that is very problematic yeah and and holds people in a story in the story and not not allowed to s ask certain questions yeah uh, it's what i'm hearing in in the difference in your approach was was that you were putting yourself not necessarily as an expert but a, as a a reflector a little bit like what i'm doing now to your story um in order to maybe generate some in a perspective or yeah. and then and then the universality of that because as the people who reflect we're also um seeking clarity in in a, a shared story um and that sort of thing can't be measured like a drug can or no. a program can no and and i just when you asked her uh, what did you mean with fear-based system mm. it means it's not relationally oriented yeah and there's another funny story because I got a nickname because I refused to wear a white coat. Mm. And then they always commented on what I'm wearing. <laughs> you know? right, right. And and I got the nickname the lady. But I didn't uh, mm. ref refuse to wear a white coat because I wanted to get yeah. compliments for my yeah. clothes. Yeah, I did not want to uh, appear in a white coat because the relationship was for me, uh, yeah. uh, you know, what I was working with, not not my status in that sense. But uh, it, it, it it's symbolic of the yeah. the illusion of objectivity of the clinician, isn't yeah. it? The white coat, the yeah. it, the sort of performance of uh, the detachment, and um, yeah. rather than the interrelational interbeing. And um, and yeah, yeah, and see that that is a good example actually um, to think about how patriarchy works because mm. I know that my boss wanted to do something good for me. He wanted m me to be like them, mm. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. one of the white cards. I actually had a position. I was paid like my medical colleagues, so I had a really good position there. Mm. So I mean, but uh, you know. I want. I work differently, very differently, of course, mm. and yeah, I, I that other, my nickname changed from the lady to the doctor killer afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> so this another story where I didn't go along. Where you know, so a new doctor came and and I I did some research and a study there. So I I have people coming into my group and and working on that study, but. Uh, he he really wanted to say, I decide this, who's going there, I'm the doctor, kind of thing. Yeah. And while I had discussed it with my boss and I said, look, if he's uh, talking to you about I want you to know this is happening here. Mm. And he called him over and this guy got really angry and said, one has to go, with G or me or so. And wow. and my boss didn't really like to be talked to like that. So in the end, he left. So in the in the hospital, you know, was like, oh, they should, the doctor killer. So that's how I got my name. I live now with with a doctor for yeah. how long? I don't know, nearly thirty years, twenty seven, yeah. twenty eight. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, 
great. I'm not great. really killing. <laughs> no, great story, but I feel like that that is the product of um, of the worst aspects of patriarchy mm. or the power over patriarchy as opposed to yeah. a distributed and um, embedded in the hearth of community patriarchy mm. alongside matriarchy. Mm. That fallen patriarchy is um, that now, like when, when you were um, a, a student coming into your practice, um, you, you, there was this sort of tipping point and you, you really sort of speak about your father as this um, not seeing any relevance for you to have uh, mm. in that level of industrial education. And then, um, then you move into that space and, and your boss is basically... Or, or not so much your boss. Sorry, the the institution that you're working within is saying no. It's okay for women, mm. and now it's okay for everybody to be working in that space. But a, a, again, as long as you are operating within this fallen patriarchal power over patriarchal mm. um, uh, template, mm. so it's um, this illusion of diversity and inclusivity but the institutions are still inherently mm. colonial in their mm. forms. Mm. Yeah, I, I come back to that. I just had something I want to add to what I've mm. missed before. What I wanted to say about this, why I said it's a good example for a patriarchal pattern, that um, knowing that the white coat was something to, to elevate me. And, and so this... This problem, really, what women have in, in rejecting the help uh, of men, mm. um, you know, I just think that that is often, you know, that was something with my father, mm. th that I sort of wanted to do things myself and that was problematic in a way. Mm. Mm. And I th see that has been, um, you know, it's... it's uh, it pushes women into that um, fight in a way where you actually don't originally don't want to be, but you have to sort of, I guess, um, make your space, make space for you, and 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 then you then you're seen as uh, aggressive or, yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I experienced so much just by standing up for that, um, you know. Uh, Many examples, um, yeah. Yeah, the um, you were mentioning over breakfast the um, maybe I'm misreading this, but it, it seems like a pinnacle of your academic career to be invited to America mm. to set up this particular program, and this was sort of your there were the, yeah this. Do you want to just talk about that in terms of you're still. Um, I'm just focused on that word you used before, becoming. And this is your becoming story. Um, and it, it lands you in America. What mm. what happen, What happens next? What happens next? Yeah. To talk about that is kind of, you know, to, to actually um, make that clear in that space where we are talking right now, you know, that mm. we have a candle burning here. We are, um, I know that we have a lot of resonance in, in you know, the thinking and mm. um, knowing about morphogenetic resonance and mm. things like that, you know. And so we actually know that right now, you and I, we're creating future together, mm. right? We're creating a field or we we, we are in a field mm. and... And so maybe that is that awareness is mm. what, what yeah. sort of evolved for yeah. me then. But my relational orientation was always there and that always got, got me in trouble. Mm. But um but I had yeah, I guess an sort of a development and, and uh and an experience when I was over there, but traveling on my own there, um, which, say, brought me to my senses, <laughs> in a way, mm -hmm. you know. And in 
in some way you can explain it um, now a lot with with Ian McGilchrist's work about the left brain dominance and the, mm-hmm. uh, I guess, cultural right brain damage we really have, and and maybe um, I've seen how I was pulled away from myself or my core or my soul path by following this being somebody and uh, and something happened to me that I just uh, realized I um, everything's already here and you know so this this uh, consciousness change was very um, very strong also I mean um, there was going back to Germany afterwards. Uh, there, there were a lot of offers, you know, which were sedu- seducing me back into this career. Mm-hmm. But it's it's sort of that outside orientation or the inside orientation, and and that happened that I really shifted towards towards listening to that what's inside. Now I today I say you know from the head to the heart, mm-hmm. and then from the heart to the womb. Mm. And a womb to the earth, you know. Mm. So I, I am have really grown down mm. f- from growing up first, but I, I, mm. I'm growing down, and I'm growing now. I'm growing with you in this right now. Yeah. So I see that really that that um, presence is is that and radical self compassion, you know, for that what's going on right now, how we maddened and maddening each other by by following this um yeah by not being aware of our right brain damage and f- following these fear-based systems i call it you know mm-hmm. that uh, split yeah. um yeah where we do really stupid things out of fear mm. Mm. yeah and that fear is is projected so um much onto young people particularly young people today who um go into an enormous amount of debt for education, mm. tertiary education. I guess why I'm so interested in in our beginning stories is that there is such an emphasis on becoming someone. And I'm uh, really aware of, I'm reading a lot of Krishnamurti at the moment. Mm. and He talks about um, this sort of anxiety to become as part of that Ian McGilchrist trauma or damage to the right brain. Um, So I really, even, you know, someone who is much more right-brained went off to to university to study arts, Mm. uh, not sciences. I still was caught up in that becoming um, somebody. Mm. And I feel like what I'm hearing from you and I really resonate with you is the returning Mm. and rather than becoming and the reclaiming. Yeah. I think that's maybe you now the the most important bit, really. That I returned, you know, um, to to love. When I say love, I mean um, when we talk about relationship first. Just as knowing that everything starts with relationship, and mm-hmm. and that this is so. Um, blinded out in a way it's, it's um, out of our um, all our institutions societal institutions of power that that is sort of secondary or so you know first is sort of what what do we have to achieve and and so so I guess maybe it was there before in my life but I was um, not not feeling it I was actually not in Bodying it, that mm. that that knowing. So it was, in a way, in my own life. I, sh- I I talked about you know fighting patriarchy and being aware of that. And da, da, da. But mm. I I really did that in a way which was um, perpetuating it. Mm. I was actually doing the same thing. I did it in the masculine power. Mm. And so what happened was that I actually n- didn't really know what feminine power is. Mm. Yeah. I didn't know that yeah. because I hated, I hated to be like my mum. Mm. 
no voice, no, not working outside of the home or something, you know, sort of that softness and that, uh, mm. and caring is sort of like devalued, you know, so, um, so I had that all in me. Yeah. And so that is the main part really that I realized, oh my God, it's me, <laughs> you know. Mm. And so, yeah, that was a big journey in, in dropping one thing after the other. You know, and so that whole journey of, of leaving journey, Germany behind and my life and my financial security and everything, mm. reputation, and, and, and it was just really um, big. But, but for that was uh, well, instead of that security thinking became trust, mm. you know, trust in life and trust in myself and... Mm. Uh, Trust and is, didn't you, hmm. sorry to no it's okay yeah i just it, when you're speaking there just when you 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 landed trust into this room i, I just immediately had this because you were talking about fear it's like the antidote to fear mm. trust is the antidote to fear and that's that sort of the fear is the becoming and the anxiety around becoming and doing and the trust is the the grounding, the earthing, the the image of, of you moving from your head down through your body, through your womb, back into to the earth that you presented. And I, I feel like you can only do that with, with trust mm. and, as you say, relationships, mm -hmm. to, to foreground relationships. My journey then into letting that all go, go you know what came was th that i actually opened up to become a mother which was absolutely off you know not on my agenda really that to uh, do that ever and so this this returning we talked about the return um this allowed me I mean, i'm so grateful actually for this experience not i mean i'm grateful to be here it's my birthday but you know that's that my son is here and and uh, that mm -hmm. is i mean that gift of life to understanding how life is a gift mm -hmm. and and what responsibility we have in that that you know as well mm -hmm. but um this return is kind of what, what what usually um what we don't have the language for yet it's something we we actually we can't really grasp with our current language mm. and so when we get closer with poetry but um Certainly not with the academic language. And maybe we can also meet another time about it because that's exactly what I'm working with and, and, and with the return of the mother. Mm. I'm talking with a young woman in in Canada. She's Moroccan originally and, and she talked about that Amargi is a word um, in Sumerian language for the return of the mother. Mm. And so I am actually want to create a space for not only women but you know, for us to make space for whatever comes in to that return of the mother, to actually just put the f put your foot down and say, "Well, there's a space," and we we gather this whatever is there for us in term of that experience of the return of the mother. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's very strong, and that story of that turning towards the mother mm -hmm. is um, is such a full body full earth full mm. cosmic experience which mm. you know um yeah the um word for placenta in german oh yeah what is that <laughs> the word for placenta in german is mutterkuchen which means mother cake mm. yeah i feel like that's on the way that's the poetic mm. language around because when i when i witnessed my first son's placenta and when you brought that to the breakfast table, <laughs> having these pancakes, <laughs> um, I wasn't cooking pancakes, but I was. It, when as soon as you said mother cake, it just makes so much sense. And there's a relational uh, um, 
connection I have to placenta through that language, whereas placenta to me, I don't know what the etymology mm. of, of it is, but it's codified. Mm. It doesn't take me straight to the fact that there is this life force, this food that, that has... Nurturance. Mm, yeah, that has brought this, that has fed mm. this baby mm. through through the mother mm. into the placenta, into the to the baby. And so mother cake is just, it's beautiful <laughs> and it's relational. Yeah. And I think there are words like this still in in the more sort of modern languages, even English, that particularly, as you say, in, in poetry or used um, in, a, in poetic language, that we can create relationship. Um, but there, you, I, I really resonate with what you're saying. There's also all these, un, this sort of absence of language that, um, mm. and, and constantly, language constantly being deleted. And even the word mother in, yeah. it, is a project of the academy to delete mother and father and grandmother and breastfeeding. Mm. And mm. Th- these, there is, an, uh, there is a, a, a very, um, uh, sort of deliberate um, erasure rather than um, the development of language the true inclusivity would be to extend the language to open up to other uh, possibilities and for shape shifting and um, mm. for for uh, for a greater diversity of human expression but the, the fact that it seems like a a, a very political project to erase mm. what is, I think, going on that's not actually about inclusivity and diversity. It's about more control and um, and more suppression. Mm. Yeah. When you when you come across um, universities' inclusivity guidebooks and see that suggestion to replace mother with birth parent how do you relate to that how does that i i stay out of it mm. it's too yeah. crazy yeah. <laughs> um i stay out of it because i then compost it in my being and mm. come out with um, radical compassion mm. because yeah. i um i see it you know, and I wished we, I mean, I often provoke a space where it sort of gets into the, <laughs> into a debate, which I don't want. Mm. But I, um, I find it the hardest thing to do, to talk about this from an outside perspective of saying, we are all in this together. Mm. Yeah. There is so much yeah. uh, wound and damage yeah. With these thousands of years of war between men and women, mm. and you know, and this domination system, mm. which is, and we are blind. This is like we don't know mm. that we are swimming in this water, yeah. and so we are still going in at war all yeah. the time. So, we, so going out of this water to talk, and so I think mm. we are doing that in some way to mm. get out of this water and say mm. oh look at that yeah. my god you know how did that happen <laughs> you know and that that uh, there's a guy uh, Leonard Schlein have you heard of Leonard Schlein mm. he was a um, he was a surgeon and, and and writer and artist too he wrote arts and physics and mm. the goddess versus the alphabet and mm. i find that so in in combination with Ian McGilchrist's work very interesting that he said when the alphabet came in and that abstraction into the written language, yeah. that it turned from the woman and the worship, the god, goddess down on earth yeah. to the man in the sky, yeah. you know, sort of gradually. So this is where my compassion comes in and says, that yeah. I don't blame anyone. Yeah. I think we yeah. actually, that's so early what happened and mm. continuously happened, uh, mm. you know, be more and more abstraction away from our body, away from emotion, away mm. from woman, mm. away from earth, up, 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 up. You mm. know, this is that becoming somebody and yeah. somebody is out there, yeah. you know, meeting God up there. This is Elon Musk at Mars or something, you know, yeah. and that whole 
bloody AI thing that we, you know, that is exactly that um, away from the mother, yeah. away, f you know, sort of like yeah. devaluing where we're coming from. Yeah. If it's the earth or the mother or the, yeah. you know, it's that down and up thing. Yes. Yeah. So that's what I see. And then I, um, I, of course, I have this, my old self. <laughs> Which wants to go to war? Mm. I say, are you crazy? You know, so, but mm. but I don't allow. My, I don't go in there. I have yeah. no. I know I have only a certain time left on this planet, and I need to decide what what I want to feed with my energy. Yeah, and I think that's why I'm reading Krishnamurti at the moment. Mm. Is, is he recognizes so clearly this war mm. and that this war within? And I, through reading him, see the war that I'm carrying, the part mm. part of the the soldiery that that mm. I'm bringing. At times, and and that's why um, the ritual ceremony in the forest to, to celebrate the solstice mm. last night, and coming together and in circle and deep listening and yeah. co-creating, um, and not being derivative, not harking back to some romantic idea of the sacred, but actually mm. just a kind of barefoot um, reculturing through what the mother, what mother country is speaking in as limited as that feels to me at this stage. Um, I, there is enough sensibility. There is enough, uh, quiet listening and opening that I, I know what a post-war culture can look can mm. look like and gail thomas's work um as she's a american feminist who um re has really in modern days reinstated the pandora myth through the vases through the illustrative vases rather than the word of hesiod who demoted pandora mm. she goes well before him back into this pre-alphabet oral culture. And I feel that really is important. The last chapter in my doctorate was about that, the return, the reclaiming of orality, mm. speaking not in scripts, not crafted, beautiful, but mm. actually directly through. And I feel I do that best when I'm barefoot. I, uh, I feel like it changes mm. something in my chemistry I, I mean, I know that I'm aware of the negative ions that come into the, the body to alleviate inflammation. Mm. So there's healing that immediately happens. I know the sort of the basics of the science of that, but I, it's much more than that. It's it's a it's a humbling. Um, it's the it's mm. the giving off of a hubris, um, particularly in the winter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a mother cake. It's like returning to the mother cake. Yeah. Mm. knowing you belong or you be you are you know this mm. Mm. yeah and that is that is for me the way forward really that mm. hearing the earth speak to us and you know really doing more ritual in that sense and and expanding that space where we draw others in with us to experience that to, but I also know that um, I have to let go some who cannot be reached mm. you know yeah. in um, in this sense who are, yeah as both of us would probably admit we couldn't be reached at this another time yeah yeah in our 20s or 30s that's right yeah so much letting go yeah and then letting go and falling into the trust mm. and um, we said that before that Dieter Tum, do you know Dieter Tum and Tamera in Portugal the mm. community no. yeah. um, well they're Germans they founded a community in Portugal I don't know 20-30 years ago um, he said, and I just love to quote him, and, uh, saying, trust is the most 
a revolutionary political term that exists today. Mm. And they have a community, they're calling it healing biotope, where the relational is in the center. Mm. That when you put relationship first, always, mm. because you have that as well, um, it does not matter if it's a relationship to yourself or to the people around you, or the family or the community mm. or the earth or the... The cosmos or whatever <laughs> or you know you are it mm. is actually um a different way of being mm. it is more that indigenous be way is mm. not it that that become in the earth or, or of being um so relationship first is 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 actually a body experience <laughs> when i say that right now i actually can i feel whole mm. And so that's uh, what was my orientation, this, this community. This Tita Tum, we, as teenagers, we read his book, Fear and Capital Capitalism. And so it came out of the student revolution and so on. And they have a beautiful project, which is sort of a similar ideology mm. to what you're doing. Yeah. Do mm. you have a, you, you said you grew up in a, um, your mother was... Um, Christian. Christian. Mm. And how does that, um, is there anything from that tradition that comes forth in you? Is there anything that you're still alive to? Um, well, I mean, colored by my personal experience in the family, but, you know, in general, I guess it's true for Christianity in general, I think, is that... Um, alienation of the body of the sin mm. that very complex relationship with my mother that she was such a good girl mm. and i was such a not good girl and that was just really you know in her way she all only you know there was a, a real problem and, and, and I, I, also i guess partly with my brother that my brother had his girlfriend was pregnant they just were 19 20 or so and that was just, uh, you know, horror in that. <laughs> so I, yeah, the, so the whole parents, thing. That was a horror to your parents. To, but to my parents, yeah. right, yeah. I, that they were mm. just devastated. Mm. But but the whole uh, story about, um, yeah, the man in the sky, that <laughs> what I said before, mm. yeah. and that uh, kind of, Trance of self aversion, you could call it, you know, mm. that, that disconnect to to your yeah. full ex experience, body experience as a human. Um, yeah, not only sexuality, it's like the, the whole being you know, that, that is, is uh, yeah, I find in some way criminal what has been done. Yeah. And the institutional space of of religion is, is i i mean movie? more in terms of that uh, meme or mental uh a space with you know um in the culture yeah mm. actually yeah. yeah maybe even beyond religion it, it, mm. what what is you know that separation what we're talking about yeah. um but christianity has certainly done a lot of damage in that sense when we talk about the mother um how how it disempowered the mother and when we disempower the mother it's very logic isn't it that that the relationship with the children cannot be harmonious or empowered in mm -hmm. a way yeah i grew up an anglican and the mother mary played a, a very small role um except around christmas mm. the joseph and mary story but i have other uh catholic and lapsed catholic friends who um talk about the mother as is very much more central in, mm -hmm. in their religious experience okay um yeah, it's not something that I'm that privy to and I, you know, I christianity is something I left that that world um in my teens. Um but I'm also really grateful for having experienced it. I didn't have a a 
uh, repressive Christian upbringing. Mm. My parents were, um, you know, very much involved in the singing aspect. And in, in many mm. respects, <laughs> with the fire choir, there is this sort of um, continuum of song and the sacred, just not in a church, in the church of the forest and in the church of mother country. And without, uh, you know, texts. Um, I mean, songs are definitely coming from the fire. And there is always a propensity, I think, for humans, particularly humans mm. as we are now, to institutionalize and create dogma and create doctrine. And so there's, you know, I, we're a long way from that because we're so emergent what we're doing there. But there is, um, yeah, I mean, if you even think, think about the prophet, Jesus Christ, and then 300 years later, the institutionalizing of, of what, and, and in a way, a kind of rebranding and a, a retelling of that story. As an institution, I share your, um, I feel like it's part of the traumatizing, just one aspect of the traumatizing over the, over the um, centuries. But there is, I, I, I wonder whether we can separate the origin story from the actual institutions that develop. Well, I, I have to say, I, I really turned away from all of this mm. and I'm quite radical in saying mm. I don't want to read anything about it either. Yeah. And I know that in these times, in these uncertain times, a lot of people actually come back to Christianity. Mm. As, you know, but mm. I think there is a search for it and they come back to uh, or to something to hold on and what the, the, the most familiar thing we grab or so but for me I think you know, we in this movement of this you know actually years ago I said humanity is splitting into species in a way you know the embodied and the disembodied mm -hmm. and and sort of I didn't know about AI then but uh, um, somehow it's kind of that that AI or this is it's it's sucking uh, our attention and energy, our life out of us, you know, mm. and, and the embodied is we come more and more to being the earth, mm. right? I mean, I'm I'm feeling that, and so I'm not interested in in reading about it and thinking much about the old mm. stories. I think mm. the new story is I'm here, mm. I'm earth. What do I sense? What message do I get now from what's around me and in me mm. and in between us? Mm. That is just my radical presence in that sense. Yeah. You responded to the Church of Mother Country when you, you first listened to that. What are some of the things that came up for you? This honoring the direct relationship to Earth. Yeah. And that this is the time and... Yeah, this this kind of earth spirituality, you know, it's not like I want to go to church, but then the name or the, that word uh, for that, what you mentioned before, that it needs to be a collective thing now that we have to come in together in ritual. And, yeah. um, so that was speaking to me, yeah. you know, and um, my church is the mother country and I have yeah. personal you know experiences of you know and visions where I yeah this new consciousness coming up from the earth it's not coming from yeah. above yeah. you know it's actually here yeah. it's actually here yeah. and so it's for us to grow grow these new senses you know uh, kind of um, healing our right brain damage our coll collective right brain damage yeah. and so we do that by you know, honoring our earth connection and yeah. build a collective space for it. So that was speaking to me. Yeah. Mm. And what I'm also fe feeling, listening to you and, and, you know, your not necessarily objection, but not, not requ non-requirement of, say, the story of Jesus Christ is, um, is a kind of, do we need that? Is there, is there already enough noise? We sit, we tend to be an overcomplicating species. <laughs> and so, yeah, when, uh, when I'm connecting back 
with you when you speak about the Church of Mother Country is just that, is that just that primalcy yeah. of connection. Yeah. And that if we yeah. over invest in story, mm. it's almost Absolute. like a, a psychosis. Yeah. We actually, we, we, we are too vain, too, too arrogant to, to allow that it can be simple. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. this is kind of that left brain thing again. You know, yeah. but it's true. It it can be very, you know, that 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 simplicity is is an um, yeah offense against our mm. <laughs> being important and, yeah. and having being clever. Yeah, mm. and drawing back on mm. all these historical references and stories yeah. and um, yeah, it's it's almost the more that we consume in terms of story mm. and knowledge, mm. the more uh, the more we stay in that Promethean mind uh, and the less we connect with heart and gut and, in your case, mm. and women's case, womb, that womb story, uh, which, is, which is that Ga- Gaia, Pandoran, mother country... Um, foundation of life yeah and we certainly haven't heard enough yet of the women's and the mother's experience Mm. in terms of our spiritual experiences and beliefs Mm. and um, you know these stories about men you know i want to see the story of of the the mother you know talking about her life having sleepless nights with a crying baby and mm. and actually I tell you that I have in that time when Luke was little I, I wrote a little bit as as her wholeness the daily mama PhD pay her daily mm. <laughs> you know this because mm. I thought I heard you know people talking about his holiness the da- Dalai Lama and mm. And about how to be happy and happy, happy, happy. And I thought, I mean, I wasn't unhappy, but I was um, enraged that I have to, I mean, I'm <laughs> saying now, to, to listen to an old man with bad English to yeah. tell me how to be happy when he never had a baby crying and, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. I didn't sleepless nights with. Yeah. The, this is the kind of thing yeah. where I felt like, oh my God, there is something yeah. really missing on this planet. Yeah. That's and that is my the fire which drives me in saying, yeah. you know, guys, or oh, mind guys, men and women, you, we have to do something. Mm. We we cannot we cannot hear that yet, and men and women can. There's something we are not able to hear yet. That's why, you know, that's why I say I mean, we haven't got the language yet yeah. for this power to emerge in and between us. Mm. Or, we, or we're yeah. making it. We're making it right yeah. now. And I think we've had the language, mm. and we've lost the language, mm. and it's it feels timely to to reclaim the language or yeah. to, to renew the language. I guess what Meg and I are often discussing is how do we raise boys mm. and girls to be full humans mm. in in the great scope of of Absolutely. of what that means. Yeah, and that I feel like the language that you're mm. wanting to bring it is, mm. is a language shift. Yeah. So to get caught up in the new political speak, and, yeah, and even even serve that or even have an opinion in it mm. is, I hear that mm. what the wisdom of what you're saying. Yeah, is. and yeah, like we said before, you know, actually stepping out of it and and, and saying, oh. This is the water we're swimming in. That we actually are. That's an art, really, what we're doing. That because you, if you step into this um, field of talking about mother, or in, immediately sort of gendered, and then then there is sort of uh, the whole thing is uh, no, inflamed. So it's an art to to step out together and say, "Hey, mm. what's has been happening?" And you know, th- mm. so and and. It's it's great that we can do it, but I'm often getting misunderstood when when I talk about the mother and um, and and uh, um, earth or return of the mother, 
and uh, re about feminine intelligence, you know, or is this all very difficult language? But I'm I'm speaking about that. The all life happens through the f uh, woman's body. Mm. It comes into the body, and, and life comes out of the body, and it's men and women coming out of there. So it is, uh, you know, it's not men against women or, you know, or mm. this, this, we have to get, we have to step out of this water and, and start talking mm. like that. That we, when we talk about the return of that feminine power or intelligence or energy, whatever word we feel comfortable with, mm. um, then this is something for us all. And it's not matriarchy, not, not on, from my side. Mm. I'm, I'm, I don't think of matriarchy. I, that's why I say I don't want to go back so much. I really feel like we're we're really called to to invent something new. Of mm. course, not throwing everything yeah. out, but we are really now at that moment was it's it's a it's a, a big moment for us collectively mm. to to come to something. Say we together have have to. To create something that hasn't been there it's sort of an evolutionary jump time you know mm. yeah i i hear that um because in many respects we can't put the genie back in the bottle in terms of what gail thomas describes in her book healing pandora where men coming to realize that they also hold part of the mystery of life which was which was that this our seed was required in order to give birth and that took a long time and why um, feminine power was so and femi f uh, feminine culture was so revered in um, pre-patriarchal mm. societies was that women held the keys to life mm. and so we can't uh, put that back <laughs> but what we can do is to take that spirit of um, the keys to life being mother country, mm. because if we don't understand the humus, that is the, the connection. soil making, yeah. and our part in making soil, and making mother in order to remake more life, yeah. and I feel so that maybe the renewal is through, um, is is through that mother cake being the garden, yeah. being the forest, being the yeah, to reinstate mother cake. Yeah, it's the soil and the soul making, isn't it? Yeah. What you're doing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And here I have a cake which my son made, baked for my birthday. It has a uh, really nice story around it because it was a, a cake recipe my mother made for us as children, for our children's birthdays. And... Um, it was, you know, 25 years after my mother's death, we visited in Germany and met a friend, a family friend and a good friend of my mum and said, come over for coffee before you go. And and she made that cake for us and wrote down the recipe, said, that's a recipe from your mum. And then I thought, oh, that's a cake we had as kids. And... and yeah, I totally forgot about this and I wasn't very much sort of in baking then. I'm now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was how how this tradition of the birthday cake came back into our life and we honor the mother. And so that's why I talked about mother cake, Mutterkuchen as placenta. And um, yeah, honoring, honoring my mother who after a very difficult you know relationship or very complex um i had also really that gift that there was a reconciliation before she died so there is actually no resentment and i'm really happy i see that as a gift that i don't carry mm -hmm. something with me that we we both mm -hmm. had this time yeah that was beautiful and so how, how fitting um that luke made it for you yeah to, to honor his mother. Yeah. Um, and I reckon that's probably a lovely place to finish it. And just want to thank you so much for this little journey we've been on. I, I feel like I, I know you much more mm. deeply now. And 
yeah, maybe we can revisit this at some stage. At and some stage. Yeah. Yeah. And thank it's you for what you brought. Thank you too, Patrick, and I'm happy to at some other time step out of the water with you mm. <laughs> yes. and look from the outside in. Yeah. Thank you.